I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to do this, this talk on HIV vaccines, but I also want to acknowledge the huge contribution that has been made by many people, many HIV scientists in the HIV vaccine field, and uh, by many clinicians and also the community that have interacted with us and, and participated in HIV vaccine research. So I want to acknowledge the huge um, work that everybody has done uh, to get us to the stage of um, the HIV vaccine field. So um, the question I'm going to ask is whether a vaccine strategy can contribute to both prevention and cure. And I'm going to look at um, the work done in, in um, HIV vaccine trials that have been either partially efficacious or not efficacious, and look a little bit on the, the non-human primates to see what kind of data is coming out that can inform HIV prevention and control, and then to look at the neutralizing antibodies, um, both passive and, and efforts to make, um, to make um, neutralizing antibodies um, in, in, um, in, uh, based on data that we've seen before. And I'm going to ask the question whether these biological interventions uh, can lead to both prevention and, and therapy. So what kind of immune responses are required for an HIV vaccine? They need potent neutralizing antibody responses. They need, they need to be broadly reactive. They need to persist. We also need memory T cells that can suppress viral replication and an immune response that can prevent viral escape. So the rapid integration of HIV after acquisition and the inability for, this, for early therapy to interrupt this integration means that the goal of an HIV vaccine must be to prevent acquisition or eradicate recent infection. It's important to understand that it takes, from data we've seen from the AMP study, it'll take about between 50 to 100 times more neutralizing antibody to inhibit HIV than it does SARS-CoV-2. Looking at correlates of protection from prior efficacy studies may be a useful barometer to measure future vaccine strategies. So I'm going to look at the RV144 study, the HV10505 study, the HVT702 study and the HVT705 study. You can see these studies and their regimens, and you can see that the only the only efficacious or partially efficacious vaccine trial has been RV144. But there have been important correlates that have been identified in the RV144 study, which provide us a lens to, to evaluate HVT705, 702, and, 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 and 505. And for the purposes of this talk, I will focus mostly on the interplay between CD4 and CD8 T cell responses and the relationship to the, both the breadth and the magnitude of V1, V2 antibody responses. Looking at HV10505, um, this, this was a study um, looking at a DNA um, and adenophile heterologous prime boost. And this, this study showed that high CD8 T cell polyfunctionality was associated with protection. You can see on your on your right is um, is data looking at um, the um, uh, look comparing placebo to to participants who had low CD4, um, as low CD8 T cell responses, and participants who had high CD8 T cell responses. And you can see a correlate with protection. And yeah, you can see um, various um, immune responses that show the relationship with CD8 T cell poly polyfunctionality and protection. Looking at RV144. Um, uh, when we look at RV144, the V1, V2 IgG was, a, was found to be an immune correlate of risk in RV144. This correlate has been confirmed in studies in different labs using different assays and reagents. Studies were expanded to include cost clade antigens, AE sequences representing circulating strains, and a cost reactivity score. These studies demonstrate evidence that the breadth of the V1, V2 immune response correlates with HIV infection risk. It's very important also to look at the levels of IgG responses. And we've seen that um, high levels of IgG responses um, um, are required to induce protection. And this slide and these slides demonstrate the relationship between um, IgG and, and, um, and antibody responses. So this slide is a, is a slide that um, comes from RV144 and shows um, high levels of, of IgG responses and how they are associated with, with vaccine protection. You can see from 702, um, there is a role between V1, the V1, V2 loop and CD4 polyfunctionality, again, showing that there may be an association um, between um, uh, a, a, um, the breadth of the V1, V2 response as well as CD4 polyfunctionality. And then uh, looking at the results of 705, you can also see that there's a possible um, 
trend to uh, V1, V2 breadth and um, as an inverse correlation of protection. So what about messages uh, from this, from the, from the correlates of protection from these studies? Um, my message one is that three non-neutralizing HIV vaccine efficacy studies indicate that the V1, V2 loop antibodies may play a role in protection. So we can't yet eliminate this hypothesis because neither 702 or 705 um, reached high enough teters to demonstrate this role. And in HV10505, we've seen that there's a role of CD8 T cell response in protection. I'm now going to move on to non-human primate research. I'm going to focus on, on one, um, one vector in particular, and this is the recent macaque CMV vaccine with the variant um, 681, which has some genomic rearrangements. I will show you both replicating and attenuated rhesus macaque um, CMV using this variant. So the protective effect, um, so, so here you can see the um, replication or spread competent um, rhesus macaque vector. And you can see in group A, um, these macaques were vaccinated with both, with, with, with two doses of the, of the CMV vector. Group B was um, vaccinated with one dose of the CMV vector and an adeno-5, and group, um, group C was with a DNA with an adeno-5. And yeah, you can see at the bottom is that um, the groups that had the CMV vector um, were, were afforded more protection as compared to group C and D. This, this slide looks at an attenuated uh, 681 uh, rhesus CMV vector. Um, and you can see as well in this, in this um, study, you see a protection um, um, of, of, of monkeys and a rapid decline in ultimate clearance of CIV. So these protective effects um, um, are afforded by immunizing rhesus macaques. And this, ve uh, and this vector seems to be um, very exciting. Uh, the results of these studies were both unpredicted and unprecedented. So what is my message to you? Is that the CMV vectors um, 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 were protected? The CMV vectored vaccinated monkeys were protected from SIV, and the protected animals showed a rapid decline in ultimate clearance of SIV from blood after acute viremia. The protected animals also clear reservoirs of RNA and, um, and proviral DNA, and the protection has been associated with antigen specific CD8 T effector cells that recognize epitaps presented by the MHC class II and MAMO E molecules. So non-human primates can be a powerful and, and um, a powerful and enable the development of new modalities. And um, we are seeing the movement of the CMV vector into, in, into human studies. So going on to um, neutralizing antibodies, um, both pa passive and active, I'm going to start off with the VRC study, um, the AMP study. And this was a, a study that looked at um, whether um, VRC01, which is an, um, a monoclonal antibody, could protect against HIV acquisition. These studies took place in two parts of the world, um, one in the Americas in MSM and, tra and transgendered individuals, and the other in, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with heterosexual women. So this study showed that um, the in, in people who had viruses that were sensitive to the VRC01 showed protection, but um, this, this, the study did not protect anyone um, where, the, where the virus was resistant. Uh, um, was resistant. And this, this slide just shows you the pr protected efficacy over time and looks at the pooled um, VRC01 groups, and then the low dose, 10 milligrams per kilo, and then the high dose, 30 milligrams per kilo, and shows that in, and the light blue is the sensitive virus, the orange is the, inter, is the moderately resistant virus, and the, the purple is the um, very resistant virus. And this slide shows that the protective effect, effect, efficacy against the most sensitive viruses is between 68% is between 60 and 80 percent after two doses and quite constant thereafter. Um, but you can see here that the protected efficacy, efficacy against resistant viruses was near zero uh, by 80 weeks. So looking at um, whether we could take these antibodies and, and see what's happening in people who, um, have, who are HIV infected. So this study shows um, two broadly neutralizing antibodies, BBC and 117 and 10, 10, 10, 10, 1074 and um, was given to people who were um, just recently infected with HIV. And um, these, these people were, were given um, the, the, the two doses, the, 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 the two um, monoclonal antibodies. And then three days after receiving it, um, they were, uh, had a structured treatment interruption. And now you can see that um, in, in participants who received the broadly neutralizing antibodies, there, there was a, um, a, an increase in the duration 
being off, um, there was an increase in being, being off therapy um, uh, as compared to placebo and uh, viral loads more likely to be suppressed as compared to placebo. So how could we use body neutralizing antibodies in, in protecting breast milk transmission? And so we know that we've been unable to prevent, uh, to totally eliminate breast milk transmission. And we believe that neutralizing antibodies uh, may be useful in, in, in preventing breast milk transmission because of the very narrow genetic bottleneck of founder viruses. And so you may only need one or two broadly neutralizing antibodies to eliminate breast milk transmission. And work in this, in this field is ongoing in South Africa. So method three, I've shown that, um, and demonstrated that broadly neutralizing antibodies are capable of preventing HIV acquisition and provide the future roadmap for vaccine development. Broadly neutralizing antibodies may have a role in limiting breast milk transmission. And we do have a target neutralization teacher of, of more than one to 200 to be a useful correlate in future trials. AMP has also demonstrated that we need to make uh, body neutralizing antibodies to more than one site, and that neutralizing antibodies may have a role in functional cure. Vaccine approaches need to shift to elicit eliciting antibodies to known conformational structures that elicit such antibodies. And so there are new approaches that we are seeing coming into clinical development. And this is using either epitope, lineage or germline targeting and stabilized primers in different platforms like nanoparticles, viral vectors, or mRNA. And there are three major approaches um, that have been used to try and induce body neutralizing antibodies using um, uh, vaccination, using active vaccination. And that's the lineage-based, um, led by Bart Haynes, the germline targeting, led by uh, Leo Stomatatis and Bill Sheaf, and, um, and then also immunofocusing, that is both lineage and germline agnostic, and looking at um, uh, uh, to design to focus more broadly on one or more epitopes. And we'll see more work coming out of this from Peter Kwong and, um, and other groups uh, looking at various uh, targeted epitope approach. This slide shows you the value of the messenger RNA in, in this whole development. And um, this is a, a non-human primate research where um, the, uh, the, the non-human primates were, were vaccinated, first of all, with a, um, a, 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 an autogalous envelope that had a decosylate, had a the 276 um, uh, glycan removed, and then vaccinated again with the, um, the autologous envelope that um, was repaired um, to include the 276, and then having various heterologous um, envelope boosts and the protein boosts. And this, this shows um, that multiple mRNA vaccination using different immunogens to try and coax the immune response to, to reduce, to produce a body neutralizing antibodies showed some promise in that there was, um, in the vaccinated um, macaques, there was a 79% per, per exposure risk reduction, showing promise of, the, of this kind of um, platform in, um, in being able to iterate and move far, forward faster to, to get neutralizing antibodies. And so in the next few years, we anticipate about 20 trials um, to be looking at these kind of approaches. These are experimental medicine um, uh, um, trials. And uh, you can see from the slide, the various um, antibody strategies and the adjuvants used in the immunogen strategy. So my message for is that experimental medicine will set the pace to evaluate the concept of body neutralizing antibody vaccine design. And the use of new technologies such as mRNA may allow us, us to rapidly iterate. Speed is needed to advance this concept. In terms of the end game, I've showed you that data from clinical trials and um, non-human primate research has emphasized the importance and critical role of neutralizing antibodies and, and the role they will play in protection from infection. mRNA may deliver um, envelope protein and may be a useful tool to, to aid uh, body neutralizing antibody induction. The vaccine strategy will be a, com a complex mixture of immunogens as we need to target more than one epitope. And combining these antibody approaches May, with, uh, may also elicit significant cellular and innate immune responses. The addition of mRNA platforms will allow us for quicker iteration, and um, we will probably need cocktails of monoclonal antibodies to be an important tool for both viral control and HIV and, and functional cure. So I'd like to acknowledge um, the many people who contribute our funding to our funding, and that's the Gates Foundation, DAIDS, um, j and &J, and the Reagan Institute as well as um, the HV10 Executive Committee led by Larry Corey, and obviously all our, the scientists involved in this work, our Global Cab and all our participants who enroll in our clinical trials. Thank you very much.